This is part 79 of my series on my N-Gage model railway project. Previous parts cover the project from its inception, through the creation of the baseboard, selection and laying of track, building of scenic items, obtaining rolling stock, etc. The project is ongoing. This part deals with some additional scenic details, chiefly milk churns and station posters, but also touching on a couple of other little things that I wanted to try and fix up. As I mentioned in my previous video, when I received a lot of three Stania coaches in the post, I also, in a separate package, received some P&D Marsh white metal milk churns I had ordered. I ordered these because I had been wanting to add some milk churns to the layout for a while, since milk transport was a major feature of the railways in the period I'm modelling, and I do specifically run milk trains sometimes. I ordered these white metal churns because it seemed that they would likely simulate real churns more closely than plastic. And it was also possible to get these with a decent number of churns per pack, and I wanted to add more than just one or two. I have to say that I was quite disappointed when I opened these. I can only say that the quality was rather poor, with a great deal of flash in some cases, and with the two halves of the moulds often poorly aligned, creating misaligned halves in the castings. This initial set that I opened was also missing one of the conical churns that it should have contained. The other sets were complete, with uh, ten of each type of churn per set. It was, of course, necessary to remove the flash and to do what I could to smooth out the steps in the model's coils caused by the misaligned moulds. Getting the bases of the churns relatively level in order that they would stand up was quite challenging, especially for the smaller cylindrical churns. I did all of this cleaning up work with a small flat file. Here are the conical churns from that first pack, standing up as best as I could get them. And here are the cylindrical churns from that pack. As you may see, they're not really standing up straight very consistently, but they're very small and hard to hold and file precisely, and this was the best I could do. Here are all of the conical churns from all three packs. I may have overdone the order. But since shipping from the UK was more than the cost of a pack of churns, I thought I might as well make sure I'd get enough in a single order. And here are all of the cylindrical churns, some of them a bit wonky, as previously noted. And here's the whole lot on the bench, ready for use. The next thing I turned to was adding some LMS posters to my station buildings. I got this set of LMS poster boards from Trackside Signs. These represent a bit of an upgrade over the tiny signs versions I've used in the past, as these are pre-cut and peel-off self-adhesive, which makes them a good deal easier to use neatly than the tiny signs ones I had, which had to be cut out carefully with a sharp knife and then glued. I started by putting some posters onto the Oakworth station building that I recently obtained for use on my scrapped-off station. I noted from photographs of the real station where posters of the real Oakwood station building where posters were and used that as my guide, putting one sign on either side of the window beside the ladies' waiting room and one at the very far end by the booking hall. I had to cut that one down a little bit to make it fit. I also added a sign on the end of the building where it will be readily visible due to the placement of the building on the layout. Here's a picture of the real Oakwood station, in preservation of course, showing the posters and also showing some milk churns on a handcart. I looked at a lot of pictures of milk churns on stations to try to get an idea of how churns would typically be seen. Churns, both conical and cylindrical, seem to often appear on handcarts, which makes sense since full churns would be heavy, and carts would obviously make it easier to get the churns onto the train. I'm definitely not going to put this many churns on my stations. Here's a picture from Preservation of conical and cylindrical churns together on a handcart. But churns were clearly not always handled on carts. Here are a lot of churns being loaded without carts, although I'm pretty sure these would be empty churns. Still, churns without carts were often seen in ones, twos and threes, here and there in many old station pictures typically just standing on the platform in no particular precise order. This traffic was common for a long period on the railways, from the 19th century right up to the Second World War and even after. Here's a station with a really large consignment of milk, some of the churns on carts and some on the ground. 
All of the big four railways carried some of this traffic, although the Great Western were probably the largest carrier of milk in churns, bringing it from the dairy country of Devon up to the massive demand in and around London. It seems that it's more common to see at least one or two milk churns than not to see any in, in old pictures of small stations. And milk churns are still often seen on preserved railways, although I doubt they actually carry any milk. Rolling a churn on its rim would be the easiest way for one man to move it. Lifting a churn would be better done by two men. A full conical churn would weigh about 150 pounds. Here's an interesting picture of an open wagon being used to transport a couple of milk churns, plus a calf and some other miscellaneous items. Having reviewed all of this evidence and more, I had a go at placing some churns. I started with my scrapped-off platform, taking the platform off on and putting it on the bench. I didn't have a lot of hand carts, but I took one back from transporting a trunk on scrapped off to use it for churns, and I also added some churns on the platform further down. I was in two minds whether to glue the churns down. It would ensure that they wouldn't fall if the board got jogged, but it would be fiddly to do neatly, and it would of course make future alterations more difficult. I went without gluing for now at least. I took the station building for Bilsden off the layout in order to add some signs to it. This was weighed from a Metcalf Settle and Carlisle station building kit. I added various signs in places that seemed reasonable to me. The trackside signs are generally quite easy to use. It's a little bit tricky to get them off the backing. I found the best way was to bend the backing and then use the point of a sharp craft knife to tease up the edge of the sign. Once one edge is up, tweezers can be used. Then the trickiest part is just getting the signs level. Somehow I never seem to be able to get them looking quite perfect. I put signs on all sides of the Bilston station, mostly near doors, as it would seem that would be the best place for them to be noticed. I used the full variety of signs that came with the trackside signs set coloured travel posters, black information boards, and detailed white signs with small writing. Here is the scrapped-off station back on the layout, with churns and signs. The churns are still quite imperfect, but it took me a lot of work to get them even this good. I didn't paint the churns, as I thought that white metal was probably as close to the correct colour as anything would be. I'm afraid you can see, rather, where I cut down the ensign to make it fit in this picture. Here's Bilsden back on the layout. Apart from the signs, I just put a bunch of churns towards the end of the platform. The back of Bilsden Station is a bit odd. It might help if I added some steps at the end of the back platform. It's actually quite hard to see this side of Bilsden Station, as it faces the end of the layout against the wall. So the back of the station is actually seen much more than the front. And the back is usually seen from the other end, which is why I've concentrated more of my detail at that end. Whilst I was doing this, I figured I should also put some posters on Colville Station, which uses the Metcalf Country Station set buildings. So here's the main Colville Station building on the bench getting signs. And here it is back in place on its station. I tried to fix a couple of other things whilst I was working on these details. I touched up the edges of the Bilston Station building, which I rather seemed to have neglected before, and I also used a soft pencil on some of the road joins to try to make them blend in a bit. And I used some adhesive vegetation clumps to plant along the base of the tunnel portal to try to hide the gap that tends to show there. Here are a couple of final non-flash pictures of the stations with their new details. This is the end of the scrapped-off platform. Here's the station building on scrapped-off with the new signs and the churns. And finally the near end of Bilsden Station with a couple of signs and a bunch of waiting churns.